Welcome back to Asian Art. Today we're going to talk about the premier art of ancient China, the art of calligraphy, and how it came to influence painting and poetry. Collectively, we're known as the Three Perfections. First, before we begin talking about calligraphy and painting, I'm going to talk about a very important invention that China um, created early in its history. One of the ways in which China was able to create this vast, sprawling empire and maintain and control is through communication was the invention of paper, which allowed it to produce uh, very detailed records that were easily accessible. The fact that even today, paper is this enormously versatile and useful material that appears in so many different ways, in so many different forms, we have to acknowledge its extraordinary versatility. And it's really very inexpensive to produce. If you think about the options uh, that were available at the time it was created in China, uh, they primarily wrote on bamboo strips, which are quite heavy. So Qin Shi Huangdi in the Qin Dynasty used to command 120 pounds of bamboo slat documents a day. And now you can imagine 120 pounds of documents every single day. Within a year, you would have enough to fill a room. And over several years, just trying to sort and recall information on these documents could be really cumbersome. So it was the sort of desire to, you know, in these sprawling governments with these massive projects, it was really important to have and facilitate lots of communication. This paper became this very useful thing. And it's attributed to Chai Long in the Han Dynasty, who was a Confucian scholar. Now, there's evidence that paper may have existed prior to this time. So the invention by Chai Long might have been simply that he brought it to the attention of the emperor. Uh, and it may have been something that was being experimented with in various places and parts of the country. Paper, as if you're not familiar with the construction, is fairly simple. You see this, this device here. Um, there's a tray and there's a fine bamboo mesh uh, at the bottom. And what is sort of poured into the tray is this liquid slurry of, of plant fibers that are sort of sifted down so the water drains away, leaving a mat of fibrous material. And then uh, sizing and pressing and drawing, this becomes sturdy paper. It's usually made out of waste material that is uh, very inexpensive to uh, produce. It's durable, it's archival, it's super light. The other option at this time was writing on silk. As we know, silk is very expensive, but if you had uh, something that was urgent and needed it to be tucked away, like we know in a secret way, a silk document would be uh, preferred. So with the invention of paper, this really transformed the materials available for making art and also had an impact on the way the Chinese was written. Take, for example, the, the types of script. Now, Chinese writing, I haven't talked about this too much, is pictographic in its earliest inceptions, meaning that each symbol, shape, form is used to describe an idea. It's not a sound like a, an alphabet, a character in an alphabet would, refers to essentially a sound, and we are reconstructing the spoken language when we write. Chinese does that to a certain extent, but more specifically, it's focused on ideas and combining ideas to create other ideas. So each picture, so in a sense, or each 
character, uh, in a sense, kind of describes an idea. Now here you can see over time the way in which these shaped forms have evolved. And you'll notice that they remain remarkably consistent in many ways. Now it's hard to read, of course, when you get to the more advanced forms, but there is a kind of similarity that has existed across all characters going back to the earliest times. On the column on the far right, these are the inscriptions on the Jagoan bones. And then we have the next column. These are the seal inscriptions that were used in the bronze castings. Then we start to see around the Han Dynasty, about the time of the invention of paper, the use of, of also using brushes. So you, now you have thinner and thicker lines. Brushes can hold more ink. So detailed characters with practice can be done faster and with greater precision. <clears throat> and so the complexity and the speed of writing Chinese dramatically improved with the introduction of paper and writing with brushes. Xing Quan in the Tang Dynasty became a very famous uh, scholar, not only as a man who was very knowledgeable in Confucian ethics and ideas, but he was also regarded as a great painter, as a poet, and a calligrapher. And so these three things were highly prized in skills in being a Confucian scholar. So if you wanted to rise within the ranks of the government, you not only had to pass this very rigorous and demanding exam on Confucian scholarship, but then you had to present yourself as a cultured and artistic person. And to develop and cultivate the skills in these three areas uh, was considered very important. Of course, there were all kinds of other skills that were important, but these three became known as the three perfections, meaning the ones that were given the biggest import and cachet. And everyone was supposed to have um, some skill in beautiful writing, beautiful poetry, and beautiful painting, that these were things that people cultivated. Of these three, calligraphy was considered one of the highest and most developed skills. The most celebrated calligrapher in all of Chinese history is Wang Zixi, whose writing really defined and characterized what becomes standard Chinese script even to this day. The most famous writing of Wang Zixi is lost to us. We now only have copies of copies of copies. This is one of the oldest copies we have of this text, not written by Wang Zixi, but by a student of a student. Um, the legends of this writing and the importance of this writing cannot be underestimated. It has been historically regarded as one of the greatest works of calligraphy ever composed. Wang Cixi wrote this on a very special occasion. He was invited to a party along a river at the Orchid Pavilion, and he and his friends and close relatives were there having a party, and they were drinking, and they would float cups of wine down a stream, and they sat on either side of the stream. If the cup came to you, you were to drink it and then compose a poem on the spot. They collected these poems and they put them together into an anthology. And Wang Cixi, being the greatest calligrapher among them, was invited to write a preface, sort of an introduction to the poems that they collected from their drinking party that day. And in this, uh, he writes beautifully about this lovely spring day and this gathering of friends and how wonderful it is to be among such excellent company. But then he goes on to talk about how important it is to remember these days because so often we don't think and remember the beauty in our lives and the great memories of our days, but we become 
enmeshed in regrets and we succumb to the bitterness that they infect in our memories, in our minds. And that regrets powerfully overwhelm so much of how we value ourselves and our lives. And so this is a, a really lovely poem celebrated in China even to this day that on the occasion of this writing way back in the Tang Dynasty of uh, 353 CE or AD, on this date, the first full moon of April, this was a date where people today uh, continue to write out uh, this preface as a way of practicing their calligraphy and demonstrating their respect to Wang Zixi. Calligraphy continues to play a very important role in Chinese culture. If you're in a park, you may happen upon uh, something like this. Here, someone has taken a very large brush and by just using water, has painted this beautiful calligraphy poem onto the sidewalk flagstones. As soon as the sun rises, uh, the stones will heat up and this will evaporate and vanish. You're looking at people working on writing something that will last at most an hour. And it's beautiful. And people walking through the park can read and experience the beauty of this calligraphy in this sort of ephemeral way. Uh, and this becomes a very powerful way that people can express themselves and their ideas without being kind of finding themselves in um, any political trouble. Another very interesting way in which Chinese characters are respected is that it's felt in many places to be inappropriate to merely throw away scraps of paper that have writing on them. That writing connects the Chinese to their ancient civilization and to the ancestors through a very, very long history. And that to respect these characters properly, they must be burned in these special shrines that appear throughout the country. These little pagodas for respecting characters or people will go with a handful of handwritten notes they want to get rid of. And here they will burn them in a kind of in a way that shows respect to calligraphy. Let's talk about painting now in China and some of the very important ideas that we can learn from painting in China. When we think about painting in the West and especially in Europe and the United States, you go to a museum, you'll see a painting hanging on the wall, or you may have pictures in your own home. Um, and these pictures just sit there. And they sit there regardless of the time of day or uh, regardless of the season. And they, this kind of picture tradition doesn't really exist in China. Pictures are much more uh, provisional and intimate. They're handheld. You can see here on this picture on the left, the different formats. And you'll notice there's scrolls, there are codexes, which are these sort of folded fan-shaped books. They're fans. Um, they can be wall hangings, but again, they don't stay on the wall. They're meant to be hung or held out or rolled, unrolled on a table. And there's sort of an intimacy to these objects that invites a kind of close reading and a kind of personal inspection. They are brought out on special occasions and shown to special guests according to the season and who the guest is. A person might bring out some part of their collection to share with their visitor. On this occasion, uh, if it was a very important visitor, the visitor might bring a work of art and or the host might give a work of art or even a host might invite the um, guest to write their name 
or sign a work of art that they own. Okay, this kind of interaction, this kind of exchange, when gift giving exchange, artwork was a part of this sort of patronage that was a very important cultural touchstone to Confucian ethics that ruled Chinese elite uh, in the government. We've been talking about the Tang Dynasty, which is, follows sometime after a period of confusion at the end of the Han Dynasty. And in this period, we see a huge expansion out, the sort of red extension that goes out to the west, uh, which is the Silk Road, and uh, a development of a new technology at this time, which is porcelain is a very extraordinary invention by the Chinese in that it is not a particular kind of clay body. It's actually a combination of clays that is fired at an extremely high temperature to create this sort of brilliant white hard uh, ceramic surface. So porcelain as a resource becomes enormously valuable and in later years as silk becomes more commonplace around the world, porcelain remains a special skill and provenance of Chinese manufacture all the way into the 19th century. Porcelain uh, was originally developed and designed with a kind of clay intention to create sort of brilliant white and blue glazes and sort of milky white, something that might in fact imitate the characteristics of jade. Porcelain starts to appear um, prevalently in the Tang Dynasty and especially in tomb art where people began to celebrate their wealth um, by having uh, porcelain horse figurines. Horses have been in China for many centuries and are always an important symbol of power. And in this, we start to see a, a important uh, way in which the horse is now a symbol of wealth and prosperity. And it's become very common in uh, tomb sculpture arts. A very important kind of ceramic uh, uh, bronze piece here is the um, flying horse. This is from the Han Dynasty. I show this here as a beautiful example of a horse as a symbol of power and a horse as a symbol of wealth and prosperity. Horses were brought from Central Asia and they required great care and uh, maintenance. And so as China becomes more prominent and powerful, this horse becomes a symbol of the prosperity and the power of the new Chinese empire. Here is a very famous painting uh, by Han Gan, who was a celebrated painter of horses. And here he is painting uh, the emperor's most famous, favorite steed, Knight Shining White. In this uh, painting, he's painting it just with black ink on uh, paper. And you can see the way in which the figure of the horse is animated and is a powerful creature. But he's also painted this creature kind of tethered to this pole. Uh, and this may have been a kind of veiled critique that this emperor who had these beautiful and powerful animals uh, left them sort of tethered up and like he kept China as a way of sort of keeping it in check and not using its full power or potential. So now when we look at this extraordinary painting, you'll notice that not only do we have a picture of horse tethered to a post, but we have all kinds of inscriptions. We have writings and then a whole flurry of red marks or stamps that cover the page. And this is only some small part of this. You'll notice that the, the main drawing is on one piece and then the subsequent pieces of paper have been added to this. Sometimes these scrolls 
um, many feet of additional paper has been added over the centuries as people have been invited to sign or comment on the original painting. And so these are inscriptions and and signatures of all the different people of importance who have come into contact with this painting and who have left their own poetic commentary on this painting. And that's what, that's what makes these paintings so rich and valuable is that they're not just you, you know singular works, but they in many ways encode the sort of vast history of uh, comments and and ideas and the famous people who have come in contact uh, with this painting over the centuries. So we have the painting and perhaps a small inscription by Han Gan. We have many, many hundreds more comments by other people. It's sort of like an Instagram post where you get to keep all the other little comments and messages of everyone who sort of liked it uh, further on. That's kind of what it is. The placement of the stamp and the arrangement of the stamps is, again, a kind of aesthetic commentary, how, who you are and how important you are, and the placement of your signature in these um, red stamps are called chops. There are many different kinds of chops that can be applied to a painting. Sometimes the characters are in negative or in positive, or sometimes they're uh, quotes of poems, um, or they're the actual names of people. And, and so there's lots of different ways in which these, these signatures and these marks uh, have come to sort of Rec be recognized by important personages, sort of creating a, a sense of the significance of the work and its history.